This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Okay, I think we're into home straight now with reference to contract law. Remember, you don't need to remember any case names. Good. Remember, a contract is an agreement supported by consideration made with intention to create legal relations. We've looked at the, each of those separate parts, then we've been looking at exclusion clauses just now, and so what I'm finishing with is a breach of contract and the remedies for breach of contract, which is principally damages. Breach of contract. The breach a contract, a breach is a break. Um, so when somebody breaks a term of the contract, they breach the contract or breach a term. And that breach may be during the contract. The contract has already started, we're both busy working, you're doing something, I'm doing something, blah, 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 blah. And then I get fed up and say, I'm not doing any more. I've broken the contract, I've breached the contract. So that's breach during performance. The alternative is where we have a contract, it's due to start in next month, the start of next month. And uh, just before the start of next month, I contact you and say, I'm not going to change my mind. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go ahead. And you say, but I, I'm relying on you. I, I made every arrangement. I'm, do, do, no, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not coming. Okay. So during performance, one party refuses to continue. The injured party, you, because I'm the one, you're not going to breach, are you? It's me that's going to be the breacher. The injured party may treat the contract as discharged if it's a breach of condition. If it's a breach of warranty, no, you can't. It's not discharged, but uh, you are able to sue for damages. So if it's a breach of condition, you can treat it as discharged, and then you can sue me for damages. Immediately. Or you can choose to wait. And hope that I will change my mind. You wait till the, the due date of the contract to start. And hope that I will change your mind. Change my mind. You may be in contact with police. Mike, please change your mind. Don't change your mind. So, injured party can sue immediately. The alternative is anticipatory breach. And again, this is the situation really where we talk about changing mind, changing mind. Breach during performance, I'm not going to go ahead. Sue immediately. Or keep asking me, keep asking me, keep asking me to change my mind. You've already started, finish the job. You've already started, finish the job. No, 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 no. Okay. Treat the contract as discharged and you sue me. Anticipatory, I'm going to contact you two weeks before and say, I'm not going to go ahead. I'm, I don't want to do it. So now you have rights, you again, you can treat the contract as, as, as discharged and sue immediately. Or, as you could with during, you can wait and you can say, leave it until the contract due date of commencement, hoping I will change my mind. And if I don't, then sue me. That's what happened in the case Hoxton Doctor sorry, um, or wait and hope the other party will change their minds and sue. But if you choose to wait, you may lose the right to sue because circumstances may change such that for me to go ahead now, it would be in the case of Avery and Bowden, it will be trading with the enemy. And so you would now lose the right to sue because I can't go ahead. I told you I wasn't going to. Now I can't. Because for me to go ahead, we'll be trading with the enemy. So you'd lose your right to action. The other one which I missed here was go ahead with the obligations. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go ahead, say you. And I say, okay, but I am. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to perform my side of what we agreed. And I'm going to do this, White and Carter Councils and McGregor. I'm going to do this for two years. And you can contact me throughout that two years and say, I'm not paying you. Please stop. I'm not going to pay you. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead. And at the end, I'm going to sue you. And that's what happened in White and Carter Councils and McGregor. I'll tell you. 
McGregor had a garage in Newcastle. I don't know, might still do. Why to counter car, why to counter councils as an advertising agency? And they contacted McGregor's garage one day when McGregor was out. He was half past eleven. He was out visiting, meeting someone. But they spoke to the foreman. And they said to the foreman, we're an advertising company and we've got the opportunity of advertising McGregor's garage on waste paper bins around Newcastle for two years at a price of would like to go ahead. And the foreman said, yeah, I think, I think we would. Yeah, we, yeah, we'll go ahead. So I think Carter Councils have a contract. McGregor comes back to the garage. He said, anything happened while I've been away? And the foreman said, no, not really. Um, oh, yeah. Um, advertising agency phoned up offering to stick adverts of the garage on waste paper bins around Newcastle for two years. Ha! <laughs> said McGregor. <laughs> the cheeky beggars. Uh, what did you, what did you, how did you tell them to, uh, to get lost? The foreman said I didn't. I told them to go ahead. No, said McGregor. So he phoned them up immediately and said, my foreman's made a terrible mistake. He's agreed on my behalf to enter into a contract for you to stick adverts about the garage on waste paper bins around Newcastle for two years and I don't want to go ahead, I'm sorry. And the White and Carter Council said, sorry, but we are going to go ahead, we're going to do it. And they did, for two years. McGregor continually phoning them, please stop, don't do any more, stop. They said, no, we have a contract. And they did. And they went ahead for two years and then they sent an invoice and McGregor said, I told you to stop, I'm not paying. He said, yes you are, and took him to court. And the court said, you're in contract, you're foreman and apparently and, and a person with apparent authority, the foreman of your garage, takes charge in your absence. He signed a contract with them. He's gone into contract with them. And now they're saying it. Now there is a, a problem here that you may think, because down at the bottom of the page, bottom of the next page, it says the injured party has a duty to mitigate their losses so that they don't suffer. The injured party should take such steps as may be necessary to minimise their losses. So why did the White and Carter councils continue? Why did they, because surely all this expense that they're incurring in preparing these advertising posters, why could they not minimise their loss and just stop? And the answer is because they weren't making losses, they were making profits. They had no responsibility to minimise their profits. If they'd stopped and failed to carry on, they would have been minimising their profits. That doesn't come into law at all. So no, they went ahead and sued, successfully sued. This one was about the outbreak of the Crimean War, Avery and Bowden. I'm not going to go into detail with you. Again, it's an interesting case. Look it up on the internet. To be able to achieve full compensation, the injured party must have been in a position where they could have completed the contract. And the Michaelis and Gallus was the chartering of a ship and it was to be chartered from a, a port, I think it was Hong Kong, it was to be chartered from Hong Kong for a three month period. But it was stuck in Haiphong and it couldn't have been 10 days before when the charterer said we don't want it they said oh all right but they didn't say we're stuck in high farm they sued they, they said well you're breaking the contract but they couldn't have got from high farm to hong kong in 10 days anyway so they would not have been in a position to go ahead of the contract so they lost the case they didn't get full compensation now damages there are two parts, in any exam question, there are two parts to damages. There's the remoteness of damage 
and the measurement of damage. And these were, these were two big elements. Now remember, from early days when we started remedies and the, the English legal system, damages is a compensatory award. It's a monetary award to compensate. It's not the award of money to punish. It's not a punishment award. It is compensation. And the idea is to put the injured party into the position that they would have been in if the contract had not been broken. Remoteness. Only awarded if the damage suffered should have been in the reasonable contemplation of the ordinary man. I'm not being sexist there, that's a quote. It's in the reasonable contemplation of the ordinary man. And the loss suffered should be as a natural consequence of the breach. It should have been, I'm about to breach a contract. What loss is the other party going to suffer? Can I reasonably foresee the consequences of my breaking the contract? Because if I can, then I'm liable for those consequences. I'm liable to compensate up to the value of those losses that the other party has suffered. Or the breacher was aware of the special circumstances of the injured party. So this should be reasonably contemplatable of the ordinary man, or, and this should arise naturally as a natural consequence of the breach, or should be aware of the special circumstances. Now again, I'm not going to go through Hadley Banksendale, which is about a windmill, uh, and the central drive shaft of the windmill. Look it up. Victoria Laundries, about a new boiler being installed at the laundry company. Um, and, and Newman Industries were late in the delivery of the boiler. They were three months late. So Victoria Laundries sued them for three months lost profits and the profit on a very lucrative contract that they were unable to bid for because they didn't have this new boiler that Newman Industries had delayed in delivering. And re Heron too, again, look it up. These are cases where re Heron too is about Sydney Harbour setting on fire. So that's an interesting case. Look it up. They are good fun. And finally then, the measurement of damages. The remoteness should be in the reasonable contemplation of the ordinary person. The consequences naturally arising from the breach, limited, limited to that, or the special circumstances. Look up these cases because they are fun, they're interesting, and they do explain remoteness of damage. Measurement of damage, the cost to turn out is necessary to put the injured party into the position that they should have been in if the contract hadn't been broken. Cynthia Hollinger and Middleton about fixes and fittings in a rented premises. And the uh, local authority took the rented premises back seven months into the, the 12 month rental period. But it spent all this money decorating out the internal premises and now the local authority is going to get the benefit. Well, he was limited in the amount that he could claim because at the end of the 12 month contract, he would have had to walk away anyway and leave the premises as they were may take account of speculative loss, and again, they may not. In the case of Anglia Television and Oliver Reed, the actor, they didn't take account of speculative loss because, well, they didn't. But they did with Thompson and Robinson, a purchase and sale of a car. Of, um, Thompson and Robinson was a Vanguard car, and Vanguards were in short supply, and so whether we had a contract to sell the car, the, the Vanguard car, and then he backed out, uh, we'd lost a profit, and therefore we were able to sue successfully. That's an interesting one because they'd agreed to sell it. I'm trying desperately to remember the figures. The Vanguard car cost 11, they'd arranged to sell it for 1320, but then Robinson backed out of the deal. So Thompson's garage were upset obviously because they just lost a profit of 220 but they were able to sell it three weeks later for 1440 but they still sued for this lost profit the vanguard cars are in short supply they've lost the profit well no they hadn't they'd actually 
still made a profit when they sold it to the second person. My question I always want to ask is this. If this person has to pay the 220 damages, why would this person not able then to claim 120 from, from here or claim 120 back? But no, they didn't. They were able to, to do that. This other one was um, a singer. Ladies and gentlemen, I might have actually got the Vanguard and the singer wrong. It was a singer car. And the singer cars were in far greater supply. May I take it as a speck of what I've got them the wrong way around. Um, so far greater supply than they the demand. And so when they backed out from buying a singer car, that was a lost profit because they had to keep the um, uh, the car on the premises. And it was like six months before they were able to sell that car again. So I've, I've actually got those wrong. That was the um, that was a singer car. May I take account of speculative loss. And this was the Vanguard car. But the principle's the same, all right? They may take account of speculative loss. It uh, depends on supply and demand of the item in, in question. Or they may not. It depends on the supply and demand of the item in question. May consider non-financial loss. And the illustration there is Jarvis and Swan Tours. And this is emotional loss. This is emotional stress. Uh, a lawyer, Jarvis, had booked a holiday. The holiday of a lifetime. He was a sad man. He was a little old man on his own and he decided to go out and see life and get himself a really good holiday of a lifetime and he booked it through Swan Tours and when he got there the hotel was still under construction and the construction workers were building away and the swimming pool was full of rubble and cement mixers and, and it was not the holiday of a lifetime that he'd paid for. An emotional loss but emotional loss until this case Emotional loss had not been covered by English law, but the court said, yeah, we can put a value, we can put a monetary amount on emotional loss. And they did do, they compensated Jarvis for this suffering of the non-holiday of a lifetime. But they may not, Alexander and Rolls-Royce, Alexander wanted to drive around his Rolls-Royce, but it was three days longer in being serviced and repaired than he had been promised, and he sued. Why? Because of the emotional loss. What emotional loss? I like to drive round town in my Rolls Royce and smile at people. And that I have been deprived of three days worth of pleasure. And the court said, get lost. Go away. Wasting the court's time. The cost of repair outweighs the loss of amenity suffered. The court's got two choices here. The past exam question was building a wall. Uh, and the lawyer, the, the examiner, had a, a woman, Anne, had asked for a builder to build a three metre high wall for, around her garden, specifically so that she would not be able to see the rubbish pit, the rubbish tip beyond her garden. And the builder built it two and a half feet, two and a half metres tall not three metres tall, so she could still see the rubbish tip. It's a breach of condition. So what about asking the court, because she asked the builder and the builder said, no, he's not knocking it down, it's a wall, a wall is a wall is a wall. And she said, but I can still see the rubbish tip. You'll get used to it, ma'am, you'll get used to it, love. Don't worry about it, you'll soon get used to that. So she sued. Now the court has got two choices here. They can either say, Demolish the wall, start again, and build it three metres high. Or, try to put a value on the loss of meaning. Try to put a value on how horrible it is to be able to continue to see this rubbish tip. And in the case of, I think, the wall, I think the exam answer suggested that it should be knocked down and rebuilt three metres high. But in the alternative, it's illustrated by the case Rutsley Electronics and Foresight. This is a swimming pool. And the swimming pool had to be three metres deep and 25 metres long. And when it was finished and all tiled and the water was in, the springboard is there. And the owner, Forsyth, comes along 
and he says, that's not three metres deep, I wanted it three metres deep, and you've only done it two metres and a bit, I wanted three metres. And they say, well, you'll get used to it, don't worry about it. The swimming pool says, well, see, it's 25 metres long. What's the cost? Not the cost involved. In emptying the swimming pool, getting the digger in, digging up the tiles, digging up all the drainage pipes and all the surroundings, all the, the bits that go to the control room and the drain pipe that drains in the event you want to enter the swimming pool, you have to drain it out to a low point into the main sub. You have to dig all that up because you won't then have the necessary fall. You've got to dig all this up and then get the cement mixes in, go down to a depth of three metres plus, get the cement mixes in, put six inches of concrete down, and then retile it, retile the sides because your tiles are now a different colour. And fill it all with water and redo all the drainage to the main drain. What's the cost of all that? Immense! For the loss of amenity. Because I like to dive, and when I dive, I like to see if we can swim to the bottom. What is the loss of amenity? Anyway, the court said, no, we can't order. We can't order the reconstruction of the swimming pool. We'll give you compensation for the fact that you can't dive in down to the depth of three metres. And if you do, you'll bang your head because it's only two and a half metres deep. Now, what I don't understand, neither with the wall building in the exam nor in Ruxley Electronics, why could you not put half a metre of wall on top of the wall that's been built? That would give you a three metre wall. Why could you not build up the swimming pool and raise the ground around the swimming pool and then retile the top bit and finish off the top and maybe put some grass around a little umbrella and a little picnic table? Why not do that and raise the ground around the swimming pool by another half metre, retile it, finish it off, and then you've got your... Why could you not do that? I don't understand. But that doesn't seem ever to come into the consciousness, neither of the courts, nor of the examiner in his two foot fire, two foot, two metre and a half wall. That's it, measurement of damages. If the cost of, uh, the cost may make an award based on the loss of amenity. And they'll probably measure it by saying, well, it's only two and a half metres, it should have been three, so you only have to pay five sixths of the price. It's two and a half over three is five over six. You only have to pay 83% of the price agreed. And finally, the injured parties are due to mitigate their loss. I think that speaks for itself, doesn't it? If I say, I will buy you a, a, a suit, I'll buy you a suit, and then I, then I decide I'm not going to, you can sue me. And you go out and buy a suit instead and then sue me for the price. Well, you don't go out and buy an Armani suit. That was never intended. I was going to get you one from Marks and Spencer's off the shelf and you've gone off and get this flash thing from Armani. No, you mitigate your loss. You go, on, you go to a charity shop and get one from there and then ask me for the money for that. No, yeah, you could go to Marks and Spencer and get yourself an off the peg one from Marks and Spencer and then sue me and I would have to pay if that's what I had promised. Okay, that's damages, that's the uh, foreseeability and the uh, extent, the measurement of damages.